Hello and welcome to another episode of Coding Secrets. Today I'm going to be breaking down what's so special about the Sonic 3D scroll routine and why it ultimately might have hurt the game. Firstly, I thought it might be helpful to explain how a game generally scrolls the screen on the Sega Genesis. There is 64K of video RAM available for games to use, and that video RAM has to hold all the graphics that you see on the screen at any given time. The smallest usable block of graphics is called a tile and is 8 pixels square. To display these tiles, there is a background layer, a foreground layer, and a sprite layer. The background layer and foreground layer know what order to display all these tiles by using a tile map. The first number in the tile map tells the machine what tile to display in the top left corner. The next number is the tile to the right of that one, and so on. This continues for the full length of the first row, which is typically 64 tiles. Then it starts again under the top left tile and repeats all the way down the screen until it's defined all the rows, usually 32. The number stored in each location of the tile map tells the machine which tile to display, which one of the four palettes to use, and whether it needs any horizontal or vertical flipping. What's great about tile maps is that you can create an entire screen using just one tile and repeating it everywhere. And so you can get interesting screens using just a few different tiles and repeating and flipping them. This obviously saves a lot of memory. So what does this have to do with scrolling the screen, you may ask? Well, and again, trying to keep it simple, the machine can offset how it displays the tile map. It can move it a pixel to the left or right or up or down, or many pixels in all directions. And if you've shifted the entire tile map, say, half a screen to the left, if it runs out of tiles to draw, it just wraps around to the first tile again. So by moving the tile map one pixel to the left every frame, you get a nice smooth scroll. But that just displays a repeating screen. How do you have a whole level's worth of graphics scroll by? Well, a tile map is generally bigger than the visible screen. It can only be in multiples of 32 tiles in any direction, that's a hardware restriction, so a typical tile map would be 64 tiles wide and 32 tiles deep. If we multiply these tiles by 8 to get pixels, that would be a resolution of 512 by 256. The Sega Genesis screen resolution is 320 by 224, or 240 in PAL, so the tile map set up this way is bigger than the visible screen. This means that you can update the tile map locations that are off screen to bring on new information without it being visible to the player, meaning you can have a level built of tiles as long as you need it to be. So going back to the 64K of video RAM, for a typical game you may use 32K for all the different 8x8 tiles that you need to create all your backgrounds, 4K for your background tile map, 4K for your foreground tile map, 640 bytes for the sprite attribute table, which also has to be in video RAM, leaving around 23K for use on things like sprites and fonts. So what does all this have to do with Sonic 3D? Well, Sonic 3D is an isometric 3D game. There were very few of these on the Sega Genesis, and fewer still that scrolled at 60 frames a second. And we had to create things like loops in 3D. The problem with all this is it takes a massive amount more tiles to create things like that in 3D. If you look at this loop from Sonic 1, you can see that most of the loop is a few repeated tiles, with just the very edges of the loop needing unique tiles. And you can also see that even those pieces can be mirrored and flipped to save even more tiles. Now look at the loop from Sonic 3D. It's almost half a screen of unique tiles to create, which would be around 17k of video RAM on its own. Because of the isometric 3D angle, pretty much everything, even the simple stuff, takes way more blocks. And it was clear early on that there wouldn't be enough video RAM to pull off the kind of graphics that we wanted for the game. So I came up with an idea that would eat a lot of ROM, but would allow us to have much more graphical variety. I decided to use over half of the video RAM and dedicate it to an entire screen's worth of unique tiles. So instead of having a tile map saying which tiles to place where on the screen, I used tile 1 for the top left corner, tile 2 for the one to the right, tile 3 for the next one and so on. In this way I built up an area slightly bigger than the whole screen made entirely of unique 8x8 tiles. This ended up taking around 38k of the video RAM. So to scroll the screen left for instance, instead of just updating the tile map to say where the new tiles went, I downloaded to video RAM from the cartridge ROM an entire column of new tile graphics to update the right hand side then the screen could be scrolled left. The same was done to at the bottom of the screen if I wanted to scroll up, and so on. Because the whole screen was made up of unique tiles, if I updated new tiles to update the edge, the rest of the screen was left unaffected. 
Now the drawbacks to this technique are many. For a start, as I pointed out, I lost 38k of video RAM just for the unique screen. Secondly, as all the graphics had to be downloaded from ROM at 60 frames a second, I couldn't use any compression, meaning all the graphics were uncompressed in ROM, which is very wasteful. And thirdly, instead of just updating around 140 bytes of video RAM in a worst case to scroll the screen, I had to copy over 2,000 bytes a frame from ROM. Given that you only had around 7,000 bytes to copy stuff around with per frame normally, this was a big chunk that would be lost that could have been used for animating sprites and so on. So I lost 60% of all my video RAM and 30% of my ability to copy data just to use ROM instead of video RAM for the graphics. But what I gain is the whole of ROM could be used for the on-screen graphics. I ended up using around 128k of ROM per level for the backgrounds. That was around four times as much as games normally could use, and it allowed us to have a lot of large and interesting features like these. However, to produce the 3D effect and to allow for things like masking and to stop graphical combinations getting out of hand, the backgrounds actually used both the foreground and background layers combined. Here is the foreground layer where you can see all the graphics that would be copied over the ROM using my technique. And here is the background layer which is actually made up of graphics stored in video RAM like a normal game scroll would. This is to avoid doubling the amount of data I would have had to copy from video RAM otherwise. So I lost even more video RAM having to store these tiles. That means that with all the tile maps, sprite lists, dedicated video RAM for the unique screen, and the tiles needed for the background layer, I ended up with very little video RAM left for all the sprites and animation, which meant I had to be very careful to organize how many enemies were on screen at any given time, and to balance the video RAM very carefully. Now, I started the video by saying this technique ended up hurting the game. Well, because of the amount of data I had to copy from ROM each frame, I could only afford to update one row and column per frame. And so that equates to a maximum scroll per frame of 8 pixels. If we moved faster than that, it would have exposed an area of the screen we hadn't yet updated. Now, if I had allowed an update of 16 pixels, I would have had to copy more than double the information per frame, and had an even bigger unique screen, taking even more video RAM. It was probably just possible technically, but I judged at the time that 8 pixels per frame was fast enough. In the end, however, because of this, the game couldn't reach the speeds that the original Sonic games could, and Sonic was all about going fast. Now, how unplayable a 3D game would get at double the speed is probably up for debate, so maybe it wouldn't have mattered that much in the end. But I think it would have definitely helped in some areas, and we could have definitely designed for its use occasionally in the game at least. Anyhow, that's how I managed to get four times the graphics memory out of the Genesis hardware. Do you know of any better, cheaper ways to have achieved the same thing? If so, please let me know in the comments. And as usual, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time on Coding Secrets. Goodbye.